Hi, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Brendan. And thank you for the chance to talk to everyone here today. It's, it's really great to be here. So, yeah, I think I'm going to take a slightly different direction, as Raymond is uh, pointing out from some of the other talks. At these early stages where we're just thinking about the future of biochar, it seems like there's a world of opportunities open up to us. And that there's just, at the moment, the opportunities and the potential just seems massive. But what I've been asked to look at a little bit today is, well, what, are, what happens at the other end of that? What, what are the ultimate limits to how far we could take this? You know, once we start really expanding, what scale could we really use biochar? Does it make a significant impact on climate change? And how does it fit into all the other things that we should or can be doing? Now, I won't spend very long in the background because I'm sure most of the, all of you are familiar with this and probably have heard this, but just to frame it quickly. So the natural carbon cycle is almost uh, balanced as we see on the left-hand side there that uh, roughly the same amount of carbon dioxide that's drawn down by plants every year is returned to the atmosphere. And the biochar cycle depends on interrupting that and removing about 50% of material that's pyrolyzed into biochar, which is quite stable. Uh, in order to reduce the amount of CO2 that returns to the atmosphere, thereby producing a net drawdown. Um, now, obviously, that cycle depends on the stability of the biochar to work. It has to be a, a very much more long lasting than the other material from which you've made it. So thank you, Raymond, for giving the heads up about the IPCC. So I'm not working on it now. This is a, actually a finished and published product. But I'd just like to point out, I think, that there is now in the latest IPCC National Greenhouse Gas Accounting Guidelines, a method that can be used also for project accounting, it's designed initially for national scale accounting to do uh, greenhouse gas accounting of biochar systems. And this is one of the graphs from that, which shows that for, if your temperature is sufficiently high, say above 450, you will have roughly 80% of the carbon remaining in, in biochar after hundred years in the soil which is um, compares to from less than 1% of the raw material that you would have made it from would be remaining if you hadn't made that biochar. Uh, so we've got a lot of confidence these days at this point in the science of the stability that it is sufficient to drive a, a, an effective drawdown over century timescales. So turning to what is the ultimate potential? Where could we take this? And I think it's useful to put this in terms of, frame this in terms of all of the carbon that plants in the world currently draw down and, where, and what are the size of these flows? So NPP stands for net primary production. NPP is the total amount of carbon drawn back down by plants every year once you've taken into account their photosynthesis and their internal respiration. So that is basically the resource base that we would use to make biochar from. And every year plants are producing drawing down roughly eight times as much carbon, or land plants are drawing down eight times as much carbon as humans are emitting as carbon dioxide. So that's the 66 petagrams. A petagram is the same as a billion tonnes. So 66 billion tonnes of carbon drawn down by plants every year, which sounds like a massive resource to work with. It's certainly very much larger than our emissions. But obviously we can't use all of that. In fact, out of that 66, we've already um, given up some of that 66 by human activities such as planting annual crops, where there were before perennial crops, which have reduced productivity by development. So, so cities, towns, roads, we've taken land out of production uh, by degrading land is, is probably one of the biggest factors there that land degradation has reduced productivity. There are some opportunities to reverse some of this degradation, return some of this lost productivity of 6 billion tonnes of carbon. And that's one of the areas that we can look at for finding a resource at which to make biochar. So this set six petagrams, to the extent that we're able to reverse some of these losses is an, is an important resource to think about. Um, and in terms of what humans take already, it's um, we're already taking from the world something like 10 petagrams. So one, one sixth almost of all the carbon that plants are on down is already used in some manner by humans. And that's, on the same order of magnitude as our current emissions. Now there are very limited opportunities to expand that. We're already in a world where habitats and biodiversity are in extreme danger and tapping further into wild habitats 
as a, as a means of expanding the amount of carbon we can use for managing the carbon cycle really is not a viable option that would have massive detrimental impacts on wild ecosystems. So we really need to be looking at where within this, uh, these flows that we're already using, could we actually find wastes and residues and unused uh, inefficiencies in the system that we could actually build on to improve our, to, to, to make biochar. Um, also to put another little perspective on this thing. So the total amount of biomass that goes into all agriculture, all food production, all forest timber removals, uh, harvested crop residues, that's roughly the same as the amount of carbon that the IPCC is already predicting will be needed for bioenergy um, over the coming century if we're to stabilize the climate. So the, the scale of the uh, of what we're hoping to get out of the natural ecosystems, the natural carbon cycle, is massive. And it's a tall order to, to think that we could even the uh, from the world's plants without having a uh, detrimental impacts. So then the question arises, well, if we avoid any detrimental impacts, if we stick just to what can be sustainably sourced in terms of wastes and residues, um, agroforestry, reclaiming degraded lands or restoring degraded lands, these kind of things, how far could we get just using these kinds of practices? <clears throat> so I'll probably skip that slide. And so, uh, um, so one of the things we need to think about in terms of working out the potential is just to remember that it's not just about the carbon in the biochar, it's a whole system. So here we see we have the resources that you use through pyrolysis to make biochar. They have multiple impacts, not just on creating the biochar soil amendment, but they also give a potential source of energy which can offset fossil fuels. They can avoid emissions from decomposition of uh, plant material producing N2O, nitrous oxide and methane, which are also greenhouse gases. They can also alleviate some of the emissions of these greenhouse gases from soil. So you need to look at the whole system perspective, including the fertility um, impacts that actually increase the soil's ability to actually create biomass in the first place. So we did a study um, with um, Jim Amanetta and Johannes Lehmann, who were also co-authors, who were also on this uh, webinar series, I think, and a couple of other people a few years ago. And I think it still stands in good stead. It's um, trying to look at the sustainability limits. So if we restrict ourselves to, to feedstocks, which don't include conversion of wildlands, that we don't impact negatively on, on food security by removing biomass that is currently needed for fodder or for soil conservation. Uh, we don't compete with food crops and we um, restrict biomass crops only to abandoned degraded land. These kind of things, no hazardous wastes, only clean efficient technology. Then if we put all of those constraints in place, how far can we get? And what we found in that study is that the resource base we could tap into is roughly in the order of over two billion tons of carbon in terms of all these wastes and residues globally that could be available for conversion to biomass to biochar without actually having negative impacts. And if you converted it into biochar, taking into account all of these system interactions on other greenhouse gases and land use, etc., that that would amount to what at full capacity somewhere in the order of uh, 1.6 billion tons of carbon drawdown per year. Obviously, it will take some time to get there. This curve, which wraps up to maximum production over several decades by after mid-century, is already in, uh, assumes an increase in infrastructure, which is faster than has ever been seen in terms of uh, infrastructure building into power se generation sector. So this, you know, we can think we can talk about how fast you can ramp up this curve, but this is already quite an ambitious scenario to get up within a few decades of these very large drawdown scenarios. So in terms of where, the, in terms of the system of impacts on, on this, it's really the main contributors are the sequestered carbon. So how the stability of the biochar itself is number one. And the second most important factor is if we can use the conversion technologies that are very efficient and capture the energy that's available in the system, and use that to offset fossil fuels, that's also the second most important factor. And we can get um, other feedbacks from reducing methane from rice and 
uh, other things, nitrous oxide emissions are smaller, um, transport and tillage impacts are very small. But one really important take home from this is that in order for the, uh, the, the mitigation that you get from converting this biomass into biochar to be better than you would get if you had simply combusted it for bioenergy to offset fossil fuels, we have to capture the spare energy. It's not good enough to use backyard methods. They won't be efficient enough to actually uh, compete with bioenergy. We need good uh, high quality technology that really is uh, uh, makes the best possible use of the energy balance of the system. So looking at the energy balance, this is for a, a dry mice, uh, feedstock of less than 10% moisture. If you do an energy balance of all the energy that's required for preheating, for pyrolysis, for heat losses, for recovery of those heat losses, etc., we see that there is spare energy that roughly, roughly eight um, out of 20 um, of the energy going in in the in biomass feedstock could be in a well-designed system available as um, for conversion to bioenergy with a lot of routes open to actually convert that. Um, so there are opportunities to make these um, energy efficient systems, but it requires good engineering. And in many cases that requires doing it at sufficient scale that you can actually get good efficiency feedbacks and capture that. Uh, the second thing that's really important to do to, to really um, improve the benefits relative to bioenergy is that you need to get these fertility feedbacks. Not all soils benefit from biochar. Uh, here we see that, for example, if you put the severity of the um, soil fertility problems from none, that's very fertile soils, up to very poor soils there, that the more, the more poor the soils are, the better the impact relative to bioenergy. But I'm quite on good soils, you typically might find that without that feedback from getting um, enhanced NPP and the beneficial impacts you get from adding to soil, you might still be better off in many cases making some of that resource into bioenergy in terms of its climate change mitigation impact. Uh, here we can see a map of how this looks globally. I won't go into too much detail, but for example, you see in main, the main uh, cropping areas in the Midwest of the US, we already have very fertile soils. We don't expect to see in that region very much benefit from biochar. Um, there are places in temperate zones where we, we, we have agricultural and poorer soils that could benefit, but really it's through the tropics that we see the most widespread and abundant soils that really benefit from these kind of systems. Uh, in terms of the soil carbon benefits, um, just speak very briefly about something called priming. So biochar has ability to change the whole of the dynamics of the soil carbon cycle when you add it to soils. And one of the things it appears to do is that in the longer term, it could help to stabilize other types of soil carbon as well, which gives us a kind of a positive feedback. It means you get more carbon stored in the soil than just the biochar you added. Now, these are long-term projections and we don't have good data over many decades to actually back this up. So this is, these are model outputs, but if this, pans out in reality, that means, for example, that we can remove more residues from a field while still maintaining soil function into the very long term. And if we can, if by returning biochar to a, a soil that allows us to actually remove more residues sustainably in the first place, then even though per unit residues converted, we might get a higher conversion efficiency to bioenergy using a using just a bioenergy pathway, the fact that we've got a larger residue base to use if we have returning biochar that we can extract sustainably more may lead in fact to an increase or an equivalent amount of bioenergy produced per hectare while still sequestering carbon at the same time. As I say, this is a little bit tentative. We need more data to back up whether this works out in the long term of many decades or not, but it's a, a plausible scenario whereby this feedback on soil carbon allows us to actually expand the resource base that we can use. So that's a little bit about uh, how much opportunity we have, but in, uh, in terms of the technical uh, constraints, how much biomass there is in the world that can be sustainably uh, accessed. But in the real world, of course, there are a lot of other factors to think about in terms of eco especially economic and social ones. Um, we need to think about how much society is willing to pay for carbon drawdown. And I'll show in a couple of slides that that's a less 
it's not entirely intuitive how that works out. One might think that this is a financing problem, that if we want to do more biochar, we should just throw more money on it. But it turns out because there are a number of things we can do with biomass to mitigate climate change, that by if we increase the price sufficiently, in fact, you end up pricing biochar out of the market and you're better off doing other things that have a bigger mitigation impact, uh, but are more expensive. Now, in terms of looking at some of the, uh, how these other constraints play out, a couple of people have tried to make estimates of it. These are not very rigorous, rigorously worked out. For example, Fusetel uh, have an estimate here of the capacity of biochar, which they think is roughly one third of the technical potential once you look at real world constraints. So they think that maybe what the, te the sustainable technical potential is maybe three times higher than what we could actually achieve. But this is not a bottom up approach that's really based more on, on intuition about it than really uh, rig rigorous bottom-up analysis. And we have a similar kind of outcome from this well-known paper from Griskamert on natural climate solutions, where the biochar bar here we see is, in this case, about five times smaller than the total sustainable technical potential, uh, largely because they did not feel that the technology for capturing the energy at the same time at scale is really proven that there's a, there's a technology development uh, barrier. Whether they're correct in that assessment or not I'm, not, I'm not convinced. But again, this is another author that found that the realistic potential is much smaller than the, uh, the, the technical potential. I'll probably skip quickly past that as well, actually, because I'm low on time. So I mentioned that it's not simply a matter of throwing more money at this problem in order to uh, scale up. Here we see a graph where we've got carbon price on the x-axis. As we increase carbon price, um, we see that around um, three or four hundred dollars per ton of carbon, that, that would be a you know, the sort of one hundred dollars per ton of CO2 kind of ballpark. Biochar becomes on average more competitive than bioenergy. Now there are error bars about that, so in certain places where bioenergy is not very attractive and biochar is, even at low carbon prices, biochar is the preferred, preferred option. But as we increase carbon price and actually pay for the carbon sequestration benefit of it, we see that it increases gradually its, its um, relative standing compared to the other things you might do with it. But there comes an inflection point where if you go high enough, you're paying enough money in a carbon price to support things like bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, which are more expensive, but have much higher mitigation potential. And then at a higher carbon price, when we get really serious about mitigating climate change, biochar will probably play a smaller and smaller role as we go up that path and maybe move more towards other things. So it's not simply a financing problem in the long term, although for the moment, unlocking potential partly is. Uh, Sorry, I've just got a couple more minutes, so I'll just uh, move very quickly for the last couple of slides. There's three more slides. Um, so on this graph here, what we can see is that we saw those big error bars about which is the most, uh, which is the preferred technology under different situations. So we've this model has been run under a vast number of different situations that play out differently in different times and different places in the world. And in purple, we see the parameter space in which BEBCS bioenergy biochar systems are the preferred way of using biomass to mitigate climate change. And we see that, for example, uh, intermediate carbon prices, not very low ones which favor bioenergy, and not very high ones that favor BEX are the preferred thing. We also see that uh, lower energy prices tend to favor it. Otherwise, we would, and higher energy price scenarios, we would tend to go away from it. And the crop yield impact is extremely important. We see biochar being favoured when it has a useful impact, otherwise really not. So we're not going to be using it in other situations. So what are the locations that really benefit from biochar? This is a sort of large machine learning model looking at all the data that's available. And two things stand out. It's places with uh, low soil pH and low cation exchange ex capacity. So the more infertile and more acidic soils where you can really collect the benefits and that allows us to do some sort of uh, analysis of where we, we think it's going to work best. Here's a map, for example, of Africa taking into account availability of residues and wastes that you could use as a resource and where those coincide with the um, soils that can benefit from it. And we see that there's a lot of heterogeneity here and that 
as we go move forward in terms of scaling up, we're going to probably see a picture in which biochar is targeted to where it works best and in other places, maybe other options that we would use that available resources there for instead. So briefly to summarize, uh, I think I'm out, out, I've overrun my time, so maybe I'll skip to the, uh, some the conclusion involved there, which is what's very clear is that the opportunities to scope biochar are large. It's maybe, maybe in terms of the technical potential, um, it could be as much as 10% of uh, current emissions. Once we take into account economic and other constraints, probably considerably less than that, maybe as much as a third of that, but still from where we are now, that, that represents a massive scale up of industry from a very, very low level we're at now. But it's not a silver bullet, so it cannot possibly change the imperative that we need to focus on reducing emissions from other sectors. There are some people that like to uh, bandy around extraordinarily optimistic uh, estimates of what biochar can do. And I think that can, is unhelpful because it makes, uh, it, it gives policymakers and others a chance to take the foot off the gas a little bit in terms of what needs to be done in other sectors. And biochar, really does not change the picture. It's something else we can do. We need to build up a large portfolio of measures, including biochar, but biochar is never going to be substantial enough that we can actually reduce our extremely, uh, the importance of reducing emissions overall. 